True Crime Fix is a podcast with adult themes and graphic descriptions of crime which may not be considered suitable for all ages. Please use your discretion when listening. All research has been conducted using material in the public domain and some opinions may not be that of the author or the host. Please remember that all victims are someone's loved one and all episodes are recorded in the utmost respect of their memory. You're listening to the True Crime Base Podcast with your host, Steve. Hello again, everyone, and welcome to our 30 second case together. If you've enjoyed the show so far, then please make sure that you've subscribed on your chosen podcast directory and all the new episodes will automatically download for you upon release. You can also listen to the new episodes through the website too. So go over to www.truecrimefixpodcast.co.uk and all the episodes are at the base of the home screen. The episodes are also available now on YouTube on the True Crime Fix channel. They're usually uploaded on the Friday after the release as a podcast. So please, if you enjoy the show, spread the word as far as possible. I would like to do a small push for the YouTube side of things. So if you do have a spare minute, could you please like, share and subscribe on the channel? I wanted to do this case ever since I started the podcast, but for one reason or another, I've always put it off. I don't know if it's the familiarity with the area or whether it was the uncertainty surrounding everything to do with the case for the longest while, or whether it was purely and simply my admiration for the strength and dedication of Josh's mum and sister throughout everything, and I wanted to ensure that I could portray the integrity of their story and Josh's story. Before I go into today's episode, I just want to explain why this has been always in the back of my mind. They say that when things resonate with you, you always remember where you were. For example, I was walking home from college on 9-11. I was in the pub doing karaoke when I heard Michael Jackson had died. And I screwed up my ankle in the canteen of my Saturday job when England won the Rugby World Cup. You get the picture. In 2015, my now wife and I had been together for just over a year and I was living at home with my parents. Having moved out of a flat that I shared and meeting Ash a few months later, it seemed logical to save some money at the time. On the weekend of the 9th to the 11th of October 2015, it started like any other for me. On the Friday night I'd been to Wembley to watch England play Estonia in the Euro 2016 qualifier, a game which we had gone to win 2-0. Whilst I was there, I made plans with some of my football team to meet the following night to watch England play Uruguay in the 2015 Rugby World Cup. At the time, I was playing football for a team based in Watford, Woodland United. Just a Sunday team, but a bit of fun nonetheless. So at about 7.15ish, I caught the 282 bus from outside my parents' home to get to East Coat High Street. We decided, as there was a few of us that lived in the area, to meet at Champers, a wine bar who had, as part of their licence, an age restriction of 21, and as the majority of us ranged between 28 and 30, it was perfect. When I say wine bar, it may have started life as that, but by 2015 it definitely wasn't. In fact, it had a reputation of having an older crowd who would be in there trying to relive their youth, but as the night wore on, the sudden realisation that they couldn't drink like they were 21 or 22 anymore would lead to some funny scenes on various other nights. On this night though, we watched the rugby and decided about 10 o'clock in the evening to catch a cab to the junction in Harrow as more of the team had arranged to meet there. The options in Eastcote were very limited. There was the Ascot, 
which had just had a facelift and was trying to attract a completely different clientele from which it used to attract as the manor house. It was your typical sticky floor pub with music. It was now trying to change to a place that you could go for food and a chat. The other option was the RE bar, which also had a late license, but was more of a hole in the wall bar, which catered for a younger audience. So departing for Harrow, it was not until the taxi ride home, after one or two shandies in the early hours of the morning of the 11th of October 2015, that we realised that anything was amiss. The cab driver told us that he was going to have to take a detour because the police had closed off East Coat High Street due to an incident. All of us just assumed that it was a drunk driver that had crashed, unfortunately something that was common for the area at the time. Little did we know that this incident would put this sleepy West London suburb on the map for all the wrong reasons. So without further ado, this is your True Crime Fix. I'm your host Steve, and this episode is dedicated to the memory of Josh Hansen. Joshua Sean Hansen was born on the 27th of February 1991 at 3.24am at Central Middlesex Hospital in Acton, West London. He was the younger brother of Brooke, who was four years older, to mum Tracy Hansen. His mum Tracy stated he was beautiful, happy and carefree and grew into an inquisitive toddler who was full of life. She continued, He grew into a happy young boy and always surprised me with his gentle and kind approach to those around him. He had a smile for everyone and his laugh was infectious. From the moment that Brooke met her baby brother, She held him in a way that I knew would bond them for life. Tracy told a story in a local newspaper about how Josh was always close to his sister and their bond strengthened as they grew up. When he was at nursery at Moss Hall School in North Finchley, he once tried to climb up a tree and crawl through a fence to find Brooke during playtime. Josh adored his older sister too, and he was as protective of her as she was of him. They would spend hours on end playing happily, and it was a bond that continued as they grew into adulthood, sharing holidays, nights out, and even the same friends. Josh left school with five GCSEs, and went on to study at West Hearts College in Watford, where he gained a BTEC in sports science and qualified as a personal trainer. During the summer break, he decided to apply for a job as a planner for Stanmore Quality Surfacing Limited and was offered the position the day after his interview. Josh very quickly became an integral part of the team and excelled in his role and was earmarked for bigger things. He quickly climbed the ranks and was soon supervising paving and tarmac jobs conducted by 600 men. He would leave home at 5am every day and often worked half days at the weekends. He had even started learning Romanian to help him communicate with some of the road workers. His mum added, Josh loved his Nando's but his favourite food was steak and lobster. He would eat at some extremely nice restaurants and worked hard to treat himself. He loved champagne. Josh loved the finer things in life. She continued, The thing that sticks out the most is that he was hysterical. He had an amazing laugh. He'd walk into a room and everybody who was there would want to be with him. As he got older, Josh was proud of his body and he was a keen bodybuilder spending long hours in the gym working on his physique. He would spend his rest days with his girlfriend Lucy 
who he had been with since February 2015. On Saturday the 10th of October 2015, Josh had accompanied his girlfriend Lucy Carpenter to hospital after her father had had a suspected heart attack. It had been a long evening and at after midnight following several hours at the hospital, the pair decided to join Josh's cousin and best friend, Reese Kennedy, for a few drinks at the RE bar in Eastcote. A DJ was playing R&B music and his friends were dancing as Josh went to buy a drink. The police have since released the CCTV of what happened on that night, so unfortunately I can describe it in some detail. At just after one o'clock, Josh was standing at the bar when he was approached by a man who'd been sitting on a long bench-like sofa on the other side of the bar. The bar is only small, so one CCTV camera picks up the whole pub. The man, who's dressed in a khaki Canada goose jacket and jeans, approached Josh. There appears to be a couple of words shared between the two, before a third man, obviously reacting to something that has been said, attempts to step between the two. The man gets an object from his coat pocket and holds it behind his back. The man then appears to feign a headbutt towards Josh before making a slashing motion towards his neck. A split second after Josh puts his hands up to his neck, there is the realisation of what has happened. You can see on the CCTV that a spatter of blood appears on the floor as Josh staggers backwards in shock, whilst the man calmly puts the knife back into his jacket pocket which is now soaked with Josh's blood and walks out of the bar crossing the field end road and out of sight from the cameras. As soon as the attack happened Josh was being assisted by his cousin Reese, his girlfriend Lucy, his friends and strangers in the bar, one of which was fortunately a nurse. They tried so hard to keep Josh alive and apply CPR until the paramedics arrived, but unfortunately their attempts were in vain. Josh passed away on the floor of the bar. According to the testimony of those who were there, Josh tried really hard to hold on, but he sadly ended up suffocating on his own blood due to the wound. A wound which the following Tuesday during the post-mortem at Uxbridge Mortuary would be revealed as a 37 centimetre long deep cut which had gone from his left ear to the right side of his chest cutting through his vital arteries in his neck and chest. Josh's attacker had been in the bar for a grand total of 20 minutes when he killed Josh. In order to do this case justice and why it has taken me so long to tell this story, you need to understand that there are three perspectives of this tragic event, and I will go through all of them. There is the police investigation, the family's fight for justice, and what happened to the individual who left the pub that night. Therefore, this recap of events will not necessarily be in a chronological order, and I will tell it as best I can in the way that the events played out in real time. Tracy was at home alone when she received a call at 1.20am to inform her about what had happened. The family resided in Kingsbury in northwest London, a few miles away from the famous Harrow School. Upon hearing of the incident, she rushed to the bar, a six and a half mile journey, which would have taken around 20 minutes. But when she arrived, police officers were carrying out forensic tests, so they would not let her in. DCI Noel McHugh was one of the first people on the scene, and he shared the story of the investigation on the Met Police's website. Every murder scene is tragic you visit as a senior investigating officer knowing, of course, that someone has lost their life there, he said. 
but to a police eye, you look for opportunities. I remember meeting Josh's mum for the first time at the scene, and out of the corner of my eye, I saw a refuse van empty in street bins. I had to do a double take as this was Sunday morning. The bin men were stopped in the hope that they may have emptied a bin containing the murder weapon. Unpleasant, but critical specialist search officers then sifted through the rubbish. Unfortunately for the police, this did not produce the weapon. The road remained closed while a very cool German shepherd was put to work searching for blood. Seizing CCTV from the bar was also crucial to the investigation. When CCTV is retrieved by the police, it has to be taken by a specialist engineer to ensure that nothing important is deleted and the chain of custody is correct should it be needed at trial. This engineer was on the other side of London at the time and the clock was ticking as for some reason attempts were being made to destroy the evidence. Fortunately, from that CCTV evidence and fingerprint work on the glasses that the man drank from on that night, it did not take long to identify their prime suspect. 27-year-old Shane O'Brien originally came from the Sutton estate in Ladbroke Grove, very near to the route of the famous Notting Hill Carnival. O'Brien was registered as unemployed and had no bank account so the police were not able to trace where any of his spending had occurred. He was believed to have been involved in the drug trade, but little more on that later. DCI McHugh made a very quick decision to publicise O'Brien's picture in the media, along with a reward of £10,000 for his capture. On the 12th of October 2015, the police ruled out gang violence as a motive behind Josh's murder. Chief Superintendent Nick Downing, Hillingdon's borough commander, said Josh's death was tragic and senseless, but he did not have any connection to any known gangs. On the 15th of October, Tracy posted to a blog on the Justice for Josh Hansen Facebook page. I quote, I had to officially identify Josh's body at the mortuary yesterday and my heart that was already broken is now shattered into pieces. The injury that Josh received is barbaric and to see my beautiful son laying there maimed has shot me to my core. As a mother, I will do all I can to keep my son's memory alive as the handsome man that he was and not the one that I had to see yesterday. He was a humble young man who I told every day that I loved him and was proud of him for all he represented, hard-working, caring, loyal and kind. The police's first breakthrough came within the first week when staff at the Camber Castle a pub in Camber Sands, a coastal town in East Sussex, called one of the team, Detective Constable Sam Vanner, to say O'Brien had been staying at a local caravan park. He had visited their pub following the murder, and after seeing the social media post, a member of the bar staff had recognised him. But by the time the officers got to the caravan park, O'Brien had left. There followed painstaking and time-consuming work for the murder investigation team to examine all of the CCTV in and around the caravan park and try and work out what car he had travelled in. They discovered a black VW Golf that fitted the rough timings that they had and that then enabled them to track its movements and what O'Brien did in the time following the attack on Josh. What they discovered was astounding. A 
according to DCI McHugh. I quote, You would never know that this man had just killed another in cold blood. O'Brien was seen casually enjoying a curry with a friend, posing in front of a mirror, even getting the leftovers in a bag to go, and then spending a couple of hours at Ashford Designer Outlet. You'd think a man in his position might quickly grab the first thing on the shelf and make off, but no, as CCTV shows, he carefully selected and tried on trousers and shirts, even asking a shop assistant for help with the collar sizing at one point. He was always paying in cash and was careful with that. On the 22nd of October, the family gave an emotional appeal through the Met Police. The voices you will hear are Tracy, then DCI McHugh, and then Brooke. Josh was funny, caring, kind, considerate, compassionate, hardworking, uh, supportive, generally just pretty much perfect to me. Josh was at the RE bar just after about one o'clock in the morning. He received a fatal wound to his neck. Um, we're searching for any witnesses who are at the RE bar to come forward. It, whatever information you hold, don't assume that we already have it. Please contact us. And we're also actively seeking the whereabouts of Shane O'Brien. We've released a picture. We would like to know where is Shane O'Brien now. We want to speak to him with regard to Josh's murder. And we're offering a £10,000 reward. It's the worst feeling I've ever felt in my life. One I'd never th thought I'd have to feel about my baby brother. Losing him, my best friend and my other half of me. You know, we were best friends and... Oh, I still can't imagine life without him. I really want to make him proud. I, I, I just, I just can't even begin to even think why someone would do that to Josh. Why someone would take him away from us. He had such a beautiful life and lovely people around him and I just want anyone, anyone like my mum, we just want anybody to come forward. Please don't be scared because it will help us and it will help everyone around us and we just want to give Josh what he deserves and that's justice you know be brave like us we're having to be brave every single day to help catch the person that did this and we're asking for their strength as well to do the same thing um, anyone who's hesitating about making that call or wondering whether it's the right thing to do, please look at the devastation that is caused to Josh's family. They need justice. They need you to make that call to the police today so that we can get justice for Josh. Also on the 22nd of October though, officers searched the caravan O'Brien had been staying in in Camber Sands and recovered the khaki Canada Goose jacket O'Brien had worn at the RE bar. Josh's blood was found on the sleeve as well as O'Brien's DNA. On the 28th of October, the investigation team arrested an unnamed man at Gatwick Airport in connection with Josh's killing, but there was no records as to whether they obtained any new information from this arrest. The 24-year-old was held by detectives and was eventually arrested on suspicion of perverting the course of justice and assisting an offender. On the 16th of November, in a public message, Tracy wrote, When your heart is broken beyond repair, what do you do? How do I live without my beautiful son? How can the future even seem possible without his arms around me, comforting me and telling me, it will be okay mum. What is the point to life 
when there's so much heartbreak, destruction and cruelty in this world. My son Joshua Shawn was so precious to me. Along with his sister Brooke, we had so many plans for the future. I lived for them and would do anything I could to help make them happy because that is what made me happy. No one is perfect and we had our moments like any normal family, but we had an unbreakable bond that was solid. On the same day, an appeal was shown on BBC Crime Watch. On the 20th of November, Josh's funeral that the family called Josh's final farewell celebration of his life was held at Sacred Heart Church in Kilburn. Father Terry Murray conducted the Mass, which was about an hour in length. All attendees were asked to wear anything other than black, as Josh was full of life and adored all things bright and colourful, and, as a true reflection of his personality, Tracy said, I would like you all to shine just like him. More than 1,000 people attended the service, and the mourners spilled out of the Sacred Heart Church onto Quex Road. Josh arrived at the service in a white casket, with an angel drawn on the lid in black. His coffin carried by a white horse-drawn hearse. Mourners individually lit a candle to remember Josh, and during the service, images of him throughout his life were projected onto a screen. Some of the mourners wore hashtag Justice for Josh wristbands or carried keyrings to highlight the hunt to find his killer. Close family and friends then continued on to Hendon Crematorium for a short committal service. Josh's wake was held at Alliance Park, now the home of rugby club Saracens. Josh's final farewell was an alcohol-free event other than the toast. During the wake, the attendees played one of his favourite games, roulette, and listened to some of his favourite music while looking out onto the pitch where he had spent his school sports days. Tracy told the Kilburn Times, Our broken hearts will never heal because my daughter and I now have a missing link in our family unit, Josh. To see the love pour out at Josh's final farewell celebration not only humbled us, but gave us comfort in knowing that his love reached far and wide. You will never be forgotten, my beautiful boy. Your sister and I will keep your memory alive, and we will do everything we can to get justice for you. But unfortunately, the police had hit a roadblock when it came to finding O'Brien. What they had learnt now was that O'Brien had been smuggled out of the country. It was now an international search and the leads were now limited. Two properties had been raided, one in Ricelip and one in Ladbroke Grove, but no new leads had been uncovered. The next update wasn't for another five months. On the 9th of March 2016, it was announced that O'Brien had been added to the most wanted list by Crime Stoppers and the National Crime Agency under Operation Return. Detective Chief Inspector Noel McHugh said, We believe O'Brien could be in the Netherlands, although inquiries continue into several other European countries at this stage. There is a European arrest warrant out for O'Brien, and we hope the launch of this new Crime Stoppers and NCA appeal will raise awareness and lead to his prompt arrest. But again there was no new leads. On the 10th of October, on the first anniversary of Josh's passing, the family held the first memorial football tournament and family fun day 
which was a huge success, with over 60 of Josh's friends and family members and work colleagues taking part. With still no news about O'Brien, Tracy posted a blog on the 11th of December 2016. It was clear to feel the family's pain. The pain and shock comes in waves. Some I ride like a roller coaster, and I always feared them, and others that I just about catch my breath from. The smallest thing can trigger this excruciating pain and fear. For instance, I find myself laughing. The shock stops me in my tracks as I think to myself, you just laughed. Trace, why? How could you? To seeing a new photo of Josh that I stare at for days and ask, why? Why would somebody want to do this to you? My beautiful, happy boy. In February 2017, a man by the name of Enzo Melancelli was arrested in Prague in the Czech Republic for criminal damage and assault. The man had a distinctive owl and skull tattoo on his back. He was so confident and arrogant when he was arrested, it was clear that it was no big deal for him. He was bailed as it was a low-level offence, but fingerprints were taken and later proactive computer searches were requested and it revealed his true identity. This man never reported back to the police station. O'Brien was using the Italian alias of Enzo Melancelli, supported by false documentation. By the time the investigation moved to the Czech Republic, O'Brien had moved on. The police were back to square one. Upon investigation, detectives believed that he was in the city for at least seven months. He was known to have frequented the city's nightclubs and boxing gyms. He had boxing gloves on him when he was arrested and that gave the murder investigation team leads to follow up in the form of local gyms. The team also managed to trace a barber who had cut O'Brien's hair several times. O'Brien had said that he was Australian but did not have the accent to match. They also found the tattooist he had visited to cover up his existing tattoos. Police now had an update on his appearance however, so although they did not have their suspect, they had their first positive sighting in nearly 18 months. Mugshots showed that he had grown his hair to shoulder length and had a full beard with a distinctive new tattoo of an owl holding a skull, which had covered up his previous Shannon 150406 tattoo. On the 11th of October 2017, Josh's mum Tracy shared another heartbreaking appeal to mark the two-year anniversary of her son's death. The Metropolitan Police had now increased the reward money, offering £50,000 for Shane O'Brien's capture. She said, These past 24 months have been a living nightmare, a nightmare that I would not wish on anybody. I nurtured my son from the moment I saw him, held his hand while he took his first steps, handed him his school bag on his first day at school, and watched him grow into a bright, capable, funny, and loving young man who worked hard and provided for his family. We laughed and cried together and shared our innermost thoughts and secrets. He was my son, and he was also my best friend. Imagine poring over photos and small video clips, because that's all that is left that can bring you close to almost touching your child. And imagine having to share your pain and grieving alongside a manhunt. While we grieve, 
Shane O'Brien, the man the police would like to speak to in connection with my son's murder, has yet to be caught and we still wait for justice. I hope and pray that you only ever have to imagine what I have just shared with you and it never becomes your reality because it rips at your soul and your very being. Following this appeal, another person came forward to say that O'Brien may have been in Gibraltar around this time. Information was also received that O'Brien may have been in Nice in France in early November. Officers also investigated reports of sightings in Bari in Italy. All new leads, but as 2017 drew to a close, the authorities were still no closer to catching O'Brien. Around Christmas, the police received yet another sighting that he was in a tanning shop in West London. It sounded unbelievable to the investigation team that he would be so close to home, but CCTV showed a man who looked very similar to O'Brien. Unfortunately though, after investigation, this lead also led them to an impasse, and it was back to investigating things to see what they could have potentially missed. All the time, new cases were coming in to the Metropolitan Police, and their focus was starting to be divided. In the new year, however, O'Brien's cousin, Jason Manners, was jailed for 14 years in his role in a £10 million cocaine ring and possession of a firearm. A friend, Joseph Peel, was also jailed for 16 years for smuggling cocaine and heroin via helicopter from the Netherlands to Britain. When police arrested Peel, they seized kilos of Class A drugs with a street value of £12 million, as well as 30 encrypted mobile phones. Both Peel and Manners lived on the West London estate where O'Brien grew up. The belief was that it was through one of these contacts that O'Brien chartered the plane and they accompanied O'Brien out of the UK into the Netherlands. At this stage though, although there was a European arrest warrant out for O'Brien, he was not on Interpol's list. The International Crime Police Organisation, more commonly known as Interpol, is an international organisation that facilitates worldwide police cooperation and crime control. On the 11th of February 2018, Tracy posted on her Facebook page something which again shed light on the way that the family was being treated. It read, This month has been shocking. Not only am I having to fight for more help to raise awareness to our Justice for Josh Hansen campaign. I'm also having to battle with the murder investigation team, MIT-8. Through my naivety, I thought that Brooke and I were on the same page as the Met and other crime agencies while working towards the same objective. Well, it seems that we are not. Should a family fighting for the justice for the unprovoked murder of their child have to fight for the wanted poster of Shane O'Brien to be placed on Interpol's Most Wanted? Should a family have to insist that all communication be carried out by email or text to avoid having what they say being taken out of context? Should they have to hear what they are entitled to from other mothers who have also lost a child to murder because it has not been relayed to them by any of the agencies they have open communication with? Should a grieving family have to accept 
the Mayor of London, Sadiq Khan's refusal to help us display the wanted poster on underground and overhead train stations when they have a contract with the Transport for London. Should I say nothing to the public for fear of reprisals? Is it right and just that I was not told that I could request a copy of my son's post-mortem report from the coroner's office by my family liaison officer and only found this out after being told by another grieving mum who had to do the same. Is it right that I am having to fight for justice with so many obstacles in my way? The answer has to be no to all of the above, doesn't it? These are just a few of the issues that I am sharing with you all, but there are many more. I am sharing things that Brooke and I have been dealing with on our own, and while trying to get the right advice, we are being pushed from pillar to post. We feel oppressed and vulnerable, with very few places left to turn. Victims need support. They are the ones in the larger picture of a murder investigation that need to be looked after the most. They are the only ones who are grieving. Not the investigation team, not victim support, not the mayor's office, and not the therapists. I have had enough of the platitudes The excuses, the red tape. The London Mayor said to me when I asked for the poster to be displayed on train stations, if we do it for you, we have to do it for everyone. Then do it for everyone. Step up and be counted, make it new policy. In America, appeals are shared on milk cartons. I provided the Mayor's office with the total amount of stations in London and Greater London and asked for the current official Met Wanted posters so that all families would have the opportunity to share their posters this way. And guess what? No response. Why? Oh, let me guess. Because there would be transparency. I hope this post does not shut a few doors that I have left open to me for fear of being associated with someone who is speaking up. This has happened to many other grieving families and as a consequence I have kept my own counsel up until now. I'm waiting to hear back from my MP Dawn Butler who has offered to help me and to secure a room in Parliament so that the Josh Hansen Trust can invite a cross-section of victims to talk about their experiences. End quote. On the 25th of May, O'Brien was finally put onto Interpol's list as a red notice. A red notice is a request to law enforcement worldwide to locate and provisionally arrest a person pending extradition, surrender or a similar legal action. It contains two main types of information. Information to identify the wanted person, such as their name, date of birth, nationality, hair and eye colour, photographs and fingerprints if available. Information related to the crime they are wanted for which can typically be murder, rape, child abuse or armed robbery. Within weeks of the red notice being published, there were 15 potential sightings reported to the police or the National Crime Agency who were working abroad to track down O'Brien. Four of these were investigated and eliminated from inquiries, but they gave the investigation team more places to look, in particular Efforts were being focused on Marbella in Spain, Bangkok in Thailand and Dubai. Detective Chief Inspector Noel McHugh said, 
We are really pleased with the response to our appeals since O'Brien was placed on Interpol's list and would urge people to keep their eyes open wherever they are in the world. Please don't be discouraged by the fact some potential sightings have been investigated and discounted. We want to hear from anyone and everyone who thinks they see O'Brien or has any information no matter how small. It was also believed that O'Brien used another alias, Enzo Machado. Machado means axe in Portuguese. But again, for the family, it was a painstaking wait, as there were still no concrete sightings of the Metropolitan Police's prime suspect. Tracy decided to take matters into her own hands. On the 11th of September, Tracy updated everyone again via Facebook. One of the things in her post was, The Mayor's Office have replied to my email again, saying that their position is the same as it was last autumn, and that there was no scope to support all the appeal posters in tube stations. So I'm going to do the next best thing, and stand outside them. On the 11th of October 2018, on the third anniversary of her son's murder, Tracy shared that her daughter Brooke, members of their family, a few friends and herself, had handed out over 7,000 posters in the week prior and were going to hand out another 1,000 outside Paddington Station. On one of the days of her appeal, Sky News interviewed Tracy outside of Victoria Station. It is demeaning. The last thing anyone would want to do, especially a mother who's grieving her child, is to walk around with the man the police would like to speak to in connection with his murder on her chest. It's very painful. It's very uncomfortable for me. Can I give you one, sir? Thank you very much. There's more than one person that knows where he is. Obviously, he's being helped. Just come forward, even anonymously. You don't even have to leave your name. Just do the right thing. You know, help me. No, please. Tracy added, Over the past three years, I have distributed over 40,000 wanted posters around the world. I have sent it electronically and I have shared it with your help. Throughout the world and across social media, hundreds of thousands of times. My campaigning is relentless because it's all I can do to try and get justice for my son Josh. All of Tracy's work to get justice for her son was also starting to get recognised in the community. On the 11th of February 2019, despite there still being no update of the whereabouts of her son's killer, she posted, I was asked if I would talk to Year 9 students about the effects that knife crime and Joss's death has had on me how it has devastated my family, along with Josh's friends and colleagues, and how carrying a knife is never under any circumstances acceptable. This was something that I had to prepare for emotionally, as it was something that I was not sure that I would be able to do without breaking down, and the last thing that I would ever want to do is to make children cry. Some of the footage that we have shared in our presentation, I've had to watch over and over again during the process of putting it together, and then again to seek approval to share it in schools, and then, of course, when sharing it with the young children, and this was heartbreaking. I tend to avoid watching videos of Josh laughing or talking because they are so painful and I have never shared or watched the videos of Josh's friends and family carrying Josh's coffin. But when I was sharing his story with so many children who were sat there looking at him and at me in their school uniforms, I knew just how important it was that I went on this journey with him. All of us, together with Josh, and to do all that I can to help prevent this from happening to them. 
I took a big deep breath and brought Josh into the lives of over 250 pupils. And while I was talking to them, I imagined Josh sitting there in his uniform with his friends and I knew how much of an impact it would have had on him. At the very least, he would have come home and told me about a mum whose son had been murdered and we would have sat down and discussed it at length. We would have talked about knife crime, her pain and the unnecessary loss of the life of a young man who had his whole life ahead of him but was murdered. I now know that this is something I can do professionally and while I did cry, so did the children. Not for me, but with me because they saw what everyone else saw who knew Josh. A kind, funny and caring young man with so much love in his heart and with a laugh and sense of humour that would have you in stitches. During this month, Brooke and I were also part of a workshop at City Hall discussing the Mayor's Office of Policing and Crimes Violence Reduction Unit while giving our feedback and our experience as victims of violent crime. We have also had meetings with the police gang unit who want us to share our experience of knife crime and the work that we are doing to help support others through our charity. Before I go on, I just want to express again my admiration for Tracy and Brooke. When this all happened, with it being local to me, I did keep up to date with what was going on with, I will freely admit, not a true understanding as to the impact that the campaign could have as it was over a considerably long period of time. Now that I've fully researched this and got it down in one story, I understand now why I always had the feeling that I had to cover Josh's story and make sure that I can tell everyone how incredible this family has been. Throughout the latter part of the investigation, the support the investigation team had from the National Crime Agency and law enforcement authorities across the world, including the federal agents in the United States, had increased. DCI McHugh said, We kept up the publicity drive, using every opportunity to appeal and get O'Brien's image out there, creating a hostile atmosphere to make him such a hot commodity, those supporting him would turn their backs on him. I am sure he felt that, and perhaps that's what led to the final call. Late on Thursday the 21st of March 2019, DCI McHugh was called by O'Brien's solicitor, who was based in the UK, saying that O'Brien was considering handing himself in and wanted DCI McHugh to travel to Budapest in Hungary to personally meet him. DCI McHugh said, My immediate thought was why, really? He could have walked into any police station and handed himself in as one of the world's most wanted men. Was this a trick to waste our time and resources getting out there only to find out he was long gone somewhere else. Then it changed and we were told that the meat location was now in Romania. We were able to alert the Romanian authorities who did some brilliant work and they got him, detained with three mobile phones and counterfeit documentation. Finally, on the 23rd of March 2019, O'Brien was arrested in Cluj, Napoca, Romania. So what happened during O'Brien's time on the run? After O'Brien had left the RE bar, he crossed the field end road towards the junction with Monford Way and got into a small white van driven by a friend which took him to the White City area. Police inquiries revealed that after attacking Josh, 
O'Brien left London around lunchtime on Sunday the 11th of October and travelled to a holiday park in Camber Sands. He had made arrangements whilst fleeing the scene in the white van. At around 7pm that evening, O'Brien and a friend went to a local pub. They returned the following night and in conversation with bar staff, O'Brien said that he had a caravan at Camba Sands. They then left and went to an Indian restaurant for a meal. CCTV images shows O'Brien behaving in a cool and relaxed manner, despite having just killed a man. On Tuesday the 13th of October, O'Brien and a friend drove to Ashford Designer Outlet Retail Park in Kent and visited several designer shops. O'Brien was caught on camera carefully selecting and trying on shirts and trousers before paying in cash. He also bought a suitcase and took time to have lunch. On Wednesday, October the 14th, staff at the pub O'Brien had visited saw a police Facebook appeal offering a £10,000 reward to trace O'Brien and recognised his image. They called the police, who rushed to the scene, but O'Brien was long gone. Inquiries to trace a VW Golf O'Brien travelled around in whilst at the holiday park showed it had travelled back towards London on the 13th of October and then at 1.15pm passed very close to Biggin Hill Airport. At 3.02pm, O'Brien left the country in a privately charted twin-engine propeller plane he had booked with the help of a friend called Vanessa. Air traffic control records showed its destination was the southeast of the Netherlands, near the German and Belgian borders. London Biggin Hill Airport was an old RAF airport which was converted into a private airstrip in the 1960s and is based in the London borough of Bromley. The private jet was a four-seater plane. As it was chartered from a private airstrip, he was able to fly out of the UK without a passport. O'Brien grew long hair and a beard and got the tattoo of his daughter's name covered up as he used false identification documents to travel around multiple countries, including Germany, Belgium and the Czech Republic. It was a theme throughout the investigation, O'Brien's ability to travel on false documents and undetected through countries, using private planes and highly encrypted phones, costing £3,000 apiece. He was also believed to have spent some time in Dubai, always using an organised crime network to transfer between locations before finally being arrested in Romania. When he was arrested, he had a false Danish passport under the name of Oliver Jakobsen and a Capital One credit card under the name of Jake Tyler. O'Brien used a Canadian driving licence under Jeff Williams and a false American Express card and had an Australian driving license. Extradition from Romania was swift. O'Brien was accompanied back to the UK by Met Police officers and DCI McHugh was waiting at London Heathrow Airport and watched his plane land before going to meet him. DCI McHugh said, I had mixed emotions when I finally saw him in person. A bit of nervousness, a bit more of the why. I watched that CCTV of the attack a hundred times. I still couldn't work out why he did what he did. And I also had a bit of the yes, finally. He was taken to Heathrow Police Station and DCI McHugh charged him. Not something he would normally do at his rank, but he had to complete the story. O'Brien didn't react and didn't say anything. Finally, for Josh's family, 
on the 9th of April 2019, Shane O'Brien, after 1,277 days, appeared at the Old Bailey via video link from Her Majesty's Prison Belmarsh, dressed in a black jumper and blue jeans. Judge Anne Molyneux remanded O'Brien in custody ahead of a plea and trial preparation hearing on the 25th of June and set a trial date for the 16th of September 2019. At the plea hearing, O'Brien pled not guilty. The trial started on the 16th of September 2019 in Court 14 at the Old Bailey in London. The Honourable Judge Nigel Lickey QC was presiding. Mark Hayworth QC was acting on behalf of the Crown. Graham Tembeth QC was acting on behalf of O'Brien. Mr Hayward QC said during his opening statement, For reasons that have yet to be fully explained, the defendant stood up and approached the other man. As they spoke briefly with others around them, the defendant reached for his blade and with a single slashing motion he used it. He cut his throat. You will judge for yourself when you have heard the evidence, but it was an act of pitiless savagery. The jury were then shown the CCTV footage of the attack. When O'Brien took to the stand at the start of the second week, he was asked by the defence counsel, Graham Tembath QC, to explain what had happened. O'Brien said he had sat down with three of his friends near Josh and his group before it became apparent they weren't happy with us sitting at that table. O'Brien said, Amongst our little crowd, everyone agreed that the situation seemed hostile. It felt like they judged us as soon as we sat down. After, it became obvious the problem was with me in particular. Josh in particular started being very aggressive by his facial expressions. He was making very aggressive body language, staring straight into my eyes. He was the instigator of the whole thing. He was raring to go. Personally, I felt like he was ready to attack me. O'Brien told the court that after standing to leave the bar at closing time, he approached Josh. He added, I said something along the lines of, what's your problem, leave me alone. He was smirking in a sarcastic action, still keeping up the persona. When I stood up, I didn't have a plan to do anything. When I approached him, in that split second, that moment froze. When I made that action, I didn't mean to connect with him in any way. I wanted to scare him off, to pretend to attack him, to scare him. Honestly, from the bottom of my heart, I did not mean to touch him with that blade. I did what I did because I felt I was about to be attacked. I genuinely felt threatened. O'Brien said he left the bar without realising that he had even wounded Josh, telling jurors he did not find out until around an hour and a half later. Asked about the blade that he had produced from his jacket pocket, O'Brien said that he had bought it several hours before to open boxes he had left with friends before moving to Ibiza for the party season. In cross-examination, prosecutor Mark Hayward QC asked, At the time, did you see Mr Hanson with a weapon? O'Brien replied, I didn't see him obviously with a weapon. He possibly could have had a weapon and I had seen him pass something shiny. In my opinion, when I went up to approach him, I felt under threat, and possibly he could have had a weapon. O'Brien said, that bar is very small, 
just body language can create an atmosphere. Mr Hayward said, It can, if you're looking for it, Mr O'Brien. On Tuesday the 1st of October, the jury took 55 minutes to reject, as lies, O'Brien's defence that Josh had provoked him, and he only meant to scare him. The jury unanimously found O'Brien guilty of Josh's murder. Shane O'Brien was sentenced to life in prison with a minimum term of 26 years. Upon sentencing him, Judge Lickey said, This was a grotesque, violent and totally unnecessary attack on an innocent man. The reason why you behaved in such a way may never be fully explained. You, however, know the reason. By the time you walked a few paces towards him, you had retrieved the knife and had it ready to use. Whatever reason you had cannot explain or justify what you did. You showed no sign of regret or feeling for Josh Hansen or anyone else at that scene. The court has heard from people who knew and loved Josh, people whose lives have been affected terribly by your actions. They have struggled to cope with the fact that Josh was murdered by you for no reason at all. You took that knife with you into the bar intending to have it available to use. You murdered Josh Hansen in front of people who were enjoying a Saturday night out. They had to see and experience the death of Josh Hansen. This was a random attack with no warning in an otherwise pleasant social situation. The wound and the blood lost must have been visible to all. Josh Hansen stood up and must have been acting unusually because he was disorientated and confused by the result of his injuries. Some witnesses were reported to have been so shocked they became confrontational with the police when they arrived. Judge Licky QC determined that there was some premeditation but little planning. He accepted that O'Brien did not intend to kill but rejected any suggestion he was acting in self-defence. He deemed the intent to seriously harm by slashing a man's neck is not significantly different from an intent to kill. Judge Licky QC told O'Brien, You are not sentenced to prison for a number of years. You are sentenced to life imprisonment. Even if you are released from prison, you will remain on license for the rest of your life. As he was dismissed from court, Shane O'Brien nodded up to members of the public gallery. A man stood up and said, Save yourself 26 years and kill yourself, you fucking c. O'Brien smiled as he was led out of the dock. DCI McHugh said after the sentencing, It's been a long and complex investigation, and we feel it. During the last almost four years, officers have joined my team, been promoted, retired, and two DCs died suddenly of cancer within six weeks of each other. DC Venet, who took the initial breakthrough call, and DC Bernie Looney, another hugely valued colleague and friend. So during the trial, I had a lump in my throat as I heard evidence gathered by those amazing officers who are no longer with us. Josh's mum, Tracy, said about the conviction. The aftermath of Josh's murder has left us broken beyond repair as Josh was taken from us in the most horrific way possible, suddenly, abruptly, viciously and violently. 
and nothing will ever erase the CCTV footage of Josh's final moments from our minds as he was struck with a knife so horrifically and callously along with his suffering as he tried to fight for life. She also gave this statement outside court. Tracy asked the Metropolitan Police to share the footage of the attack online after the trial, saying, Sharing the CCTV with the public was important for me for many reasons. Josh was innocent. He did nothing wrong. And now everyone can see for themselves that he was just an innocent young man enjoying a night out any shadow of doubt that anyone had as to why Josh was murdered, I hope has now been answered. I also want everyone to see what happens when someone carries a knife. You either become a murderer or a victim of a murder. Josh was my son. I was a mother and a father to him and I will do whatever I can to make changes to knife crime in his memory. He is not a victim, he is a life changer, and his story that is heard and will continue to be heard by thousands of people will save lives. But Tracy did not want to stop there. She now wanted to make sure that this did not happen again. She also wanted an inquiry into the background how a man had been allowed to walk into a bar after the hour of last admittance and also carry a knife in unchallenged. On the 11th of October 2019, in between the guilty verdict and the sentencing, she posted on what was the fourth anniversary of Josh's passing. What makes it even harder is the coroner has rejected my application for an inquest to take place. When I requested it two years ago, he agreed that we should have one, so it was postponed. But since the sentencing, the coroner now feels that it's not necessary. Again, our antiquated laws and previous legal cases from which they base their decisions on to not go ahead with an inquest are not relevant to me as I want answers and have waited long enough, silently, and respectfully. The coroner does not think that the RE bar, now known as the Geo bar in Eastcote or Hillenden Borough Council, need not answer for their failings, but I hold them partly responsible for Josh's death. The bar broke its license as they continued to allow people in after midnight and they did not search people coming in or asked them for ID on the night of Josh's murder. Hillenden Council and the Hillenden Police also failed their community as they did nothing leading up to Josh's death to support the Residents Association's request to carry out checks and take their complaints about the bar seriously enough when they asked for its license to be reviewed because of antisocial behaviour and late night disturbances. Two years prior to Josh's murder, another young man had been stabbed in the RE bar. So why was this bar allowed to continue to operate when there was no precautions put in place to search people for knives or offensive weapons coming into the bar? Shane O'Brien was also 
high risk to the public. He had 17 previous convictions, two of which were for knife offences. In fact, the most recent offence was just over a year before he murdered Josh. He was caught walking into a nightclub with a knife. He was charged and was given a community order and a suspended sentence. Had he been given a custodial sentence, which he should have been given, Josh would still be here with us, living his best life. I won't even get the opportunity to ask the probation services in court what measures they had put in place to ensure that the public were safe, or if a rehabilitation program had been put in place, unless I take out a private prosecution. Having an inquest would have enabled me to ask direct questions to all of the above and for the public to hear their answers. Why does the coroner not deem these issues in the interest of the public important enough? Is life not precious? What if this happened to another young innocent person? I personally have no connection to this case at all except it having happened about a mile and a half from my home at the time. But again, I want to express my admiration for the strength of this family. Tracy is still fighting to this day for answers. You can see her monthly blogs where I took the majority of her comments from at thejoshhansontrust.org. Whilst you are there, see if there's anything you can help with. But at the end of the day, this case has been eating away at me for years and now I'm truly happy that I have been able to tell Josh's story. So that's it for this week. Please remember if you enjoy the show or want to know more, please follow us on Twitter at True Crime Fix Pod. That's at True Crime Fix Pod on Twitter. The podcast also has a Facebook page True Crime Fix Podcast but there's also a fan page True Crime Fix Discussion I'm thoroughly enjoying interacting with everyone on there and this is where I post the majority of the information on the week's cases You can also visit the new website www.truecrimefixpodcast.co.uk Also a reminder that this podcast is on Patreon so please visit www.patreon.com forward slash true crime fix podcast. I also have an Instagram account, so search true crime fix. Also, if you have any suggestions or feedback for the show, please contact me through the website on the contact us page or at true crime fix podcast at gmail.com. That's true crime fix podcast at gmail.com Until next time stay safe look after each other and live life to the fullest because you never know who or what might be coming around the next corner Take care everyone